So the goals for this section are to understand what is accomplished in validation and understand a risk-based approach to validation and what that means when we look at temperature mapping, because that's why we're all here. How many people are familiar with validation or have worked in it? Writing protocols, executing them, reviewing. Excellent, everybody. Um, I first uh, started in validation 15 years ago. I remember the first time I realized I could tell stories about 15 years ago, I realized it was kind of getting old. And I was, uh, I did uh, temperature mapping, it was the first thing I did. I showed up on the job and they handed me a, uh, a K digit strip with like 64 odd thermocouples off the back and I was, I was kind of overwhelmed. Um, I also had uh, difficult under, difficulty at the time understanding what it was I was actually doing. You know, I was, I was filling out worksheets. I was uh, making sure that what I saw was actually what was happening. But I didn't have the, uh, the depth of understanding that I feel I have now about the purpose behind it. And it was, it was really hard to describe that I was you know, making sure that processes were operating in a state of control. So when people said, validation, what's that? So I would just say, you know, like, like parking? Parking validation? Either that or I'd, I'd, I'd tell people, you know, validation. They think that I went around to people and told them what a great job they were doing. Which, but sometimes I get to do it, and that's the fun part of the job. But here's uh, some more about it. This is a, a working de definition I like. Um, a methodology to provide confidence that a process will provide or produce consistent and valid results. Basically showing that it operates in a state of control. Um, we're monitoring the process while it's being performed, finding ways to challenge it, defining what successful results look like beforehand. We're not just doing investigation, we're actually showing that something is doing exactly what we expect it to do. And uh, oftentimes determining efficient ways to monitor what a successful procedure looks like. And of course, documenting that the entire way. Um, I like, I think, uh, Cleaning validation really um, exemplifies what's going on because it really is a, a process that often involves equipment, which is what we're, we're, we're verifying our equipment when we map, but it's really a process being done with that equipment. Has anyone ever done cleaning validation? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of the stinkiest validation out there too. You have to find the dirtiest dirt in your entire facility. Like, what's the hardest stuff to clean? And then you get to investigate and find the surface that's the hardest to clean. And then once you've identified those, you can do a, a, a challenge of your, train, your cleaning procedure, which, you know, would often be uh, wash something for 10 minutes at uh, with water that's uh, 100 degrees Celsius with a 10% uh, solution of, of soap. And then you challenge it by washing it for less time with cooling water and with less soap. I've got eight minutes, 80 degrees, and 5% there. And then you can run through this procedure with the magical number of three times. Oh, things always seem to be done in triplicate. And then check those to make sure they're clean. You know, looking for uh, residue of your dirt, looking for uh, sterility, whatever the important factors are in your, uh, your cleaning procedure. And if it shows up clean with the reduced testing, with the reduced procedure, with the dirtiest dirt and the hardest to clean uh, surface, in the challenge scenario, you have confidence that it'll be clean if you do it at the full, full pressure washing scenario. Um, and now, because we've got this confidence, all we have to do is monitor the procedure instead of checking every piece of glassware to see if it's clean. And it might even be that when you're checking to see if something is clean, you make it dirty. If you're doing a, a, a plate to see if there's any bacteria there, you're actually putting gunk on your glassware, now you can't use it. So before, the only way you could tell if something was clean was to make it dirty, but after you've validated it by changing it, by doing this, uh, tightly controlled, documented uh, testing scenario with the challenge, you now can monitor your procedure. You found a more efficient 
uh, way to monitor a successful process and probably even uh, you know, save money and time because you're not doing as much testing. I think it's, a, it's really good to really clearly see how a process is validated. And now all we're doing is when we're moving to, to uh, validating equipment, we're just imagining the same process being done with equipment. Automated, just going through a washing machine while we do it. We're not hand washing it anymore. Um, for those who did uh, have done cleaning validation, you probably know I left off a step here um, in making sure that rinse water is clean, which you can't exactly tell by using less soap. But just for simplicity's sake, I left it out. So don't use this to, to go challenge your, your, your cleaning procedures. It's just a, a, an instructional uh, example. But that's what we're hoping to get out of our validation, is confidence that our process works well. And hopefully have a way to monitor it, monitor it so we know that it's working well. So not only are we getting the, uh, the confidence, we're also gaining an efficiency along the way. So some vocabulary. A lot of words show up in, uh, in validation. And I think every company kind of defines those words the way they want. Um, qualification and validation, even verification shows up in there. Um, these are two slightly different uh, definitions, but all focus on the same idea that it's documented, highly controlled conditions, looking for consistent results, and predetermined acceptance criteria. And I think most people agree that validation is a, is a, a bigger word than qualification. That qualification is part of the validation. And just to facilitate our discussions, that's the, the terminology I'm going to use. So we looked at validation as so where we're validating processes. But so many of the processes we're interested in, especially for, uh, for uh, temperature and humidity maintenance, are driven by equipment. In this case, it's a, it's a refrigerator. It's a, uh, it's a room with uh, an HVAC system. I'm trying to imagine what that would look like as a, uh, as a manual procedure. And there's some guy with a thermometer and a bucket of hot water and a bucket of ice trying to make sure that the uh, room stays the right temperature. There's four steps to uh, equipment qualification. And for the most part, we don't see design qualifications too much because we're not building our own refrigerators. Um, with large uh, stability chambers, often these are purpose-built, and you are looking at this step to make sure that what you're going to build before you build it is going to meet your needs afterwards. Um, it's a big shame when you end up with a, a system or an expensive piece of equipment that doesn't even do what you wanted it to do. Um, I have been involved in projects like that uh, where DQ wasn't done. They hired me to come in and qualify a $100,000 piece of lab equipment only to find that they had bought the wrong thing. And unfortunately, they were so jammed with their schedule, they didn't get to it until over a year after they bought it. So they were stuck with this piece of equipment. Fascinating thing, it was a, a thermogravimetric analyzer. You may never hear of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a highly, uh, highly accurate scale inside a little tiny oven that measures changes in weight through a temperature profile to help you identify what substances you put in there. It would have been a fun, uh, a fun project to actually validate that. I'm kind of sad that we didn't have to do it. Anyway, the uh, other parts of equipment qualification are the IQ, OQ, PQ, uh, terms everyone's familiar with, uh, installation qualification, operational qualification, and performance qualification. The IQ verifies equipment is installed correctly. OQ verifies that it's operating correctly, and PQ verifies that it's performing correctly. Um, since no one's looking at me with that question mark on their face, that means you know the difference between OQ and PQ. It's very common that people don't. If it's operating and performing, how is that different? It's, it's the source of the specification that makes the difference here, is that the IQ and OQ are often manufacturer specifications, the guys that built it. They're saying it should operate within this range of parameters. You know, if it's a refrigerator, they're saying this should hold 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. And you want to know that it's going to do it for your product when you've filled it 80% full of, of blood or medical devices or of your API. 
Now, temperature mapping kind of falls somewhere in between. If you're doing an empty chamber, it's an OQ. You're making sure that it's holding the correct temperatures. If you're doing a loaded chamber, then it's PQ. So it, it follows both and is tied to the product specification, which comes out of, ideally, your stability studies or something that's been handed to you by your, the manufacturer of the product you're storing. So risk. Everybody familiar or have at least heard the term risk-based approach? I still remember the, uh, the first time I heard about this. There was a colleague of mine named Richard Logan who was basically writing our, our risk-based approach. And uh, his uh, the spell checker, um, it didn't recognize his name as a uh, as the wrong spelling. So he actually did a whole document about a Rick based approach. And we didn't find out about that until it was on the you know the QA director's desk. It's kind of funny. But risk based um, this is one word that isn't specialized. You know, like validation no one ever uses that word. Qualification, rarely used. But risk, this is a, a, uh, a concept we all use all the time with, with a lot of different definitions. The way um, we apply it here is the idea that we have limited resources to validate a given system or process and an infinite possible th number of things to check for. To uh, simplify it for uh, validation, we have a room like this to map for temperature mapping. And we could fit, you know, a million loggers in this room. But most of us don't have a million loggers to get that perfect detailed map of temperature saturation and dynamics in a space. We have like maybe five or 16. And we have to figure out how many, what can we do with what we have? How do we look at these, uh, pick out the problems that matter the most? So we get the, uh, the graph here of likely versus unlikely and serious versus minor. So for the things that are unlikely and minor, we don't really need to look at because they're not going to happen and they're not going to have a, an adverse effect on the system. That's why it's green. Good old color coding. And then at the other side, diametrically opposed, we have the, the likely and the serious. What's highly likely to happen and going to have a, a, uh, a big impact on us, on our product. Um, so obviously we need to look at these, but not at these. And where the finesse comes in is de dealing with the unlikely and serious and the likely and minor. <coughs> Deciding where to draw the line there to decide, determine uh, what's, the, uh, what's the, uh, the best use of our resources. There's another, another thought I like to throw in here that I use with um, computer systems validation. is detectability. Will, if there is a problem, will you notice? For instance, it might be uh, likely and serious or likely that you're, you have a problem logging in to a system and not getting access. However, you're going to know immediately that you weren't able to log into the system. It's really detectable. The process literally stops. So we can, we can consider the fact that things that are really obvious failures we can, uh, we can put in a non-testable zone because of the, the process won't even go forward. <coughs> so let's look at risk with temperature mapping or environmental mapping. And for me, it boils down to two questions. You know, the space and the product. For your product, do environmental extremes influence the quality? Usually we end up saying yes because we're dealing with sensitive biological molecules that, that temperature can have a, a huge impact on them. It's not always yes. Um, you know, there, there are products out there that are pretty resistant to uh, temperature changes. And the other question is about the space. In the space we're storing our sensitive product in, are fluctuations, are large variations in temperature outside of these expect, accepted ranges? outside of these um, accepted specifications, are they likely? And if we get 
yes for both of those, and then we map. So what's a situation where we might get a no? Usually, I think these are situations where we've got some inefficiencies. Say we've got a, a, a product that needs to be stored below 20 degrees Celsius, you know, below room temperature, and we're storing it in a refrigerator or in a freezer. We've got a pretty good confidence that that refrigerator is not going to get that hot, even if it's operating horribly. So we could say that, oh, we don't need to map it because we're storing it well below the limits. However, now we're maintaining a piece of equipment and paying for all the energy used to drive that refrigerator. So there's inefficiency in there driving the, uh, the protection from mapping. Or in a, in a perfect circumstance, we might work in a warehouse in Hawaii. But it <laughs> just sounds great, doesn't it? But you may not have to map there because there's not a whole lot of temperature fluctuations. It doesn't get, I don't know if it gets up to 100 degrees. Maybe it does. But so there are situations where you might not have to map, but it's generally a, 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 a universality and an obligatory thing in our industry because we've got products that are generally sensitive and our spaces tend to be highly variable. So there's one more layer of uh, risk that we can put on top of this. As I mentioned earlier, is we have limited resources for mapping. You know, we have a limited budget. We need to buy by sensors. How many can we buy? You know, how accurate are the ones we can buy? Because accurate things usually cost a little bit more. Where are we going to put them? How many do we need? How long are we going to sample for? Are we going to take data every one minute, every five minutes, every 15 minutes? There's, there's a cost to this in terms of the uh, battery life, in terms of the, uh, the time it takes to analyze the data as you get denser and denser amounts of data. And how much data are we going to take? Are we going to go for a week? Or are we just going to go 24 hours? Again, our resource here is time. And we need to decide you know, what, how are we going to hit what's most critical, make sure we've got a reasonable expectation that our space, our chamber, is going to hold the temperatures we want to see without spending more time than is necessary, more money than is necessary on equipment. There you go. There's a quick, quick uh, um, tour of background of validation, how it applies to processes and equipment, and what a risk-based approach looks like, and what that looks like when we're applying it to temperature mapping. Any questions? <coughs>